Hey everybody, we did it. We made it to episode 50. I've been having a blast having all these different guests on to talk about Type 2 fun within their sport, within their activities, and just hearing their stories and hearing what information they can provide about it. I've been learning a lot. It's been keeping me motivated to keep putting out episodes and literally every time I end an episode, I'm just, I'm grinning from ear to ear because these people are just so interesting and so fun to talk to. So this episode's gonna be a little bit different. It's just gonna be clips from Clips from the last 10-ish episodes, little short clips. So if you just sit back, you'll kind of get a teaser of, you know, the last few episodes that we've recorded. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, if any of these ring with you, check out the description and the full episode will be down there. Hope you enjoy. This one, the Crazy Mountain 100 is definitely like the most life-changing experience like I ever went through in my life because it's... It's 100 miles, which 100 miles is 100 miles. It's There's no joke about it, but it's 100 miles through the crazy mountain range, mountain range in Montana. It's like central Montana, where we're traveling up to 10,000 feet elevation. Conoco Pass was it was what it's called. We have to do it twice. Like I, I like to say, like, I found Jesus a couple times, like, on this race, because it was so, like, impactful, like, so emotional. It's hard to describe unless like you there and you see the beauty in the country and just how hard it was like mentally and physically like to know where i where i was at one point in my life back in like 2011 2010 when i was fat and out of shape and couldn't you know tie my shoes without breathing hard or like wanting to sit down you know to like running the crazy mountain 100 that like where i've came the emotions are just crazy but like the beauty of the crazy mountains like the race like it's put on through native land like you know native americans the uh, like they did like a native american blessing at the beginning like where they had indian like burning sage and like giving like a, a prayer like everything about it like it's it's a it's a crazy amazing race like crazy amazing right I, I highly recommend it everybody should do it but there is some qualifications to do it like a little story of it my friend richard who i ran it with were <laughs> i always laugh about this we're running like it's middle of the night like i don't know two in the morning one in the morning two in the morning i don't know whatever it is and like we're running down the trail one way and then like i see a light coming through the other way <laughs> And I think it's like a headlamp. You know, everybody's got headlamps on. I was like, man, are we going the wrong way, Richard? He's like, I don't know. This is the only trail. So I'm yelling up there. I'm like, hey, hey, are we on the wrong trail? Like, are we on the wrong trail? And I got no response. And like, we're still kind of running, you know, like walking, looking up there. I'm like, dude, we're lost. I was like, they're up there and we can't get up there. And we go a little bit farther and he looks back and he looks up. He goes, Joel, he goes, bro, that's the moon. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I don't know if I was hallucinating or what I was seeing, but I was like, I was lost. Like that was like the highlight of like the race is that like do in doing it with my friend, Richard, he's a solid dude. And I, I, it's so hard, it's so hard to explain. Like I always say too, we always joke around my friend, uh, Richard and I, like if anybody knows who Cameron Haynes is, he's like a badass ultra marathon bow hunter like just an all-around savage dude and our claim to fame is that our crazy mountain 100 time is faster than cam haynes's crazy mountain 100 time so we just that's a little snippet of it like a fun little joke that we talk about because he's a if let's be real if i was going to race him one-on-one -on -one, i wouldn't hold it i wouldn't couldn't stand a chance but the fact that my time on ultra signups faster than cam haynes is you know gives gives us something to joke about <laughs> a friend of mine came from back east he came out here to hunt with, with us for a week with me and another friend of mine that lives here and we were over we were down in southern california kind of by the kern river and uh is you know big giant canyons down there and a lot of brush so the dogs treat a fox down in there um they were we got to the top ridge and they were down in there i don't know like three miles as a crow flies you know that's not counting all the ridges and everything you got across to get there so realistically to where the dogs were is probably like six miles so me and the, the other guy took off hiking down there to the dogs, you know, and it was, you know, it was this time of year, so it was fairly warm out. Um, so we were hiking down there and hiking, hiking, and finally get to the dogs. 
get all the dogs, you know, tied up and kind of took a little break there because we were exhausted from walking in there that far. And so we decided we're going to head back out. And he says, I don't think I can make it back up that mountain because it's steep. I mean, it was straight down, steep, crawling through rocks and brush and everything else. And so I said, well, we can get a hold of uh, those guys on the radio and tell them to go down to the river and we can just walk down to the river, which is another, I don't know, it was probably 10 miles down the river, but it was all downhill at least. And so we uh, we take off and we walk and walk and walk. And then he is uh, he's getting slower and slower and slower. Well, his feet were blistering up and he had uh, he was getting dehydrated. So I had to go to the creek and we got more water in the creek and started going again. And he's just getting slower and slower. But he's not wanting to tell me anything, you know, and I'm like, you know, are you OK? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. But I noticed he's just, you know, not walking like he was earlier. So. By this time now it's getting dark. And so I, I, you know, asked him, Hey, you want to just lay down here and get a little bit of rest and get up in the morning and try it again. And he, uh, he said, yeah, we'll do that. So I got a hold of my other buddy on the radio that was going to pick us up at the bottom. And I told him, you know, we're going to sleep here. I'm going to shut my radio off. So it has battery and I'll be up at five 30 in the morning and I'll call you on the radio. So we get up at 5.30 the next morning, or we slept on the side of a hill anyway. There was not even a flat spot. It was, you know, it was kind of warm during the day, but it got pretty cold there at night. And we're just laying out there with all these dogs sleeping by us, you know, only thing keeping us warm. And uh, so we, I don't even think I slept. I just kind of laid there all night. But got up the next morning, we start walking out, and he's not doing any better. He's just getting slower and slower and slower still and just barely going. And so, you know, this was, this went on for another six seven eight hours you know trying to get out of there and it's starting to get towards the evening time again and i finally get to where i can get those guys good on the radio and we're like at this point we're only about two and a half three miles from the river but we're like we had, we couldn't cross the river because the current river is a big big dangerous river so we had about three miles of the river and about six miles to go down to where the bridge was where we can cross the river so I get a hold of my buddy on the radio and told him what's going on. And he's like, we're going to have to get him help. We can't let him spend another night in here. And so he goes down the river and luckily there was some, they're doing a rescue down. Somebody got in the river or something. They're doing a rescue down there. So they had the sheriff's had their whole team down there at the river. So he told them what was going on, told them kind of where I was at. And so the sheriffs all walked in there, hiked in there to where he was at, got to him. They got his shoes off and his shoes and his feet are just blistered and bleeding. And I mean, they're in bad shape. Look like hamburger meat almost. And uh, yeah. so, but he never told me nothing this whole time. You know, I didn't know that he was that bad shape. You know, I just thought he was wore out, you know, dehydrated and all that. But um, yeah, his feet were just, just shot. So they, once they got there, they had a helicopter that was already there. So they took the helicopter that was across the river, flew over to him landed the helicopter 500 yards from where he was sitting and they had to get him to the helicopter now he has no shoes on and he can't walk and they told him if he didn't walk to the helicopter they have to put him in one of those baskets and lift him up and he's said he's not doing that he's going to ride in the inside the helicopter so once the the sheriffs and the fire department whoever it was were there with them i i took off back to the truck so i took off with the dogs and went all the way down the trail Across the river, got in the truck, drove around there, and time I got there, I seen the helicopter flying off. It took him that long to get him 500 yards. I walked six miles by the time he got 500 yards to the helicopter. <laughs> and wow. got, him, got yeah. Then they flew him over to the other side, landed him, and then they put him in the ambulance, evaluated him, all that. And this was our first two days of the hunt, and he was supposed to be there a week, and then he was shot. He couldn't hunt the rest of the week. He just pretty much laid up in his Airbnb that he got for the rest of the time he was there. And his feet were just just blistered and bruised. And yeah, he he had a bad go. And then when he gets back back home, he told all them guys, we you thought we had rough mountains here. He goes, You haven't seen nothing yet. You need to go hunt those mountains in California. That's some rough tough terrain over there. But yeah, wow. it was, that's it was quite that's the brutal. <laughs> Oh man, I, I had another. There's another guest that came on and said they get, they got trapped on an island and had to get helicoptered off from a storm. But that's that's like nothing compared to, you know, pushing your body to the limit. That that's real lucky. You guys ran into into the 
you know, the sheriffs there or the fire department. Yeah, I just got real lucky that they were right there already, you know. Just, yeah, yeah, that's, they, they that's, pretty much saved him. Yeah, because he, he was not making it out of there on his own. No way. He was done. Yeah, yeah it's – well, talking about weights, dust in the corner, I think the biggest thing is to figure out what actually motivates you to work out. For me, I cannot work out at home. I cannot. I I do not. Um, I will only do it if I have a time crunch in some manner. Um, otherwise, I have to go somewhere. That's just that's just what I found for me. So I think everybody does need to figure out that. Maybe it's more vo- motivating because you got in the car and drove somewhere. At least you went somewhere. At least you entered your the sanctum. Even if you did one exercise, you know, that's something or it was on the treadmill for five minutes. So, um, so that's one thing I would say as far as minimal things, probably the most effective things that I've seen make progress for me is sleep, figure out what makes you feel alive. What amount of hours of sleep makes you feel really good in the morning because your body needs to recover just flat out with quality bedtime sleep not like just resting on the couch or whatever although you, there is time for that sleep is probably that's that's where i saw the most gains after six years of lifting i i tightened my sleep up and i saw like newbie gains basically um so that's huh. number one and number two is all the supplements i've tried them all protein just stick to protein just um protein and creatine Creatine is a natural supplement that will actually arguably give you maybe like a pretty big boost and it's natural. Your body makes it naturally. It doesn't, you can, you don't ever have to cycle off of it. It doesn't mess with you like steroids in any way. Um, so protein and creatine and arguably try to get at least 150 grams of protein. Uh, it depends on your body weight. I guess for ladies, a hundred grams, maybe 120. But every guy, if you're starting to, should be in the 150 or above range. But typically a one-to-one of your body weight. Um, For bigger people, probably pretty hard. So you can lower it in that sense. But keep the supplements to a minimal. Creatine, pre-workout, and and protein. You know, and that's it. Like, you really don't have to waste a lot of money. I get, like buy one get one deals every month (laughs) or go to costco or something like you can make it cheap um so that's to sleep very minimal supplements and then have a routine going to the gym don't go to the gym thinking you'll just make something up because you'll dick around and then go home um i've literally only made up my own routines twice in 10 years i always google something and have a basis and then adjust it and adjust manipulate it in some manner so that's what i've done that's what i'm doing right now i've i've taken something i've adjusted it and manipulated something that i i enjoyed in the past and doing now so those are probably the three biggest things um that to at least initiate some sort of continuous routine and and that you'll you'll see some progress from i think but in yeah, reality routine is yeah. so hard to routine is so hard to get going with anything and if you can get, get that down then that's that's mm-hmm. great which is exactly what i was about to say what it really really comes down to that's when you're motivated and going through but it really truly does come down to what can you do every single day that you will not skip What is the, what is something to get your body moving? Maybe it's a walk outside. Maybe it's uh, 10 pushups after a meeting, every meeting, or even 10 pushups when you wake up. Maybe it's, um, I don't know. uh, I wouldn't say crunches. Maybe you shouldn't do crunches as a start, but maybe it's just doing curls while you're playing a video game or watching TV or something. I don't know, but it needs to be something that you can make confident in doing every single day like three four five days a week start with two bump to three like if you're finding that you're doing it and you're maintaining it challenge yourself push yourself a little bit further but 
think, like you said, what gets everybody is setting the bar a little bit too high. And it it'll feel real daunting whenever that motivation leaves you, which it will leave you. Uh, and that's where willpower and discipline comes in. What was it about college or your upbringing that made you want to end up in Utah? Um, I, I think more of it was the side of skiing than off-roading, to be honest, or snowboarding. Um, so the Upper Peninsula, they have uh, Mount Bohemia, which is a great place for um, skiing and snowboarding. Amazing snow up there from the lake effect. So I, when I moved out there, was looking for places to move. I wanted to find places that had um, ski resorts that were, you know, really cool, great snow, stuff like that. But I also did a lot of hiking. I've done so much hiking since I was even a kid. Um, I did Isle Royale, Pictured Rocks, backpacking trips, stuff like that. Um, so I also wanted to find a place that had really cool hiking. Um, the off-roading side of things wasn't really in my huge wheelhouse uh, until I moved out to Utah. I've done, you know, I, I did a bunch of off-roading, but not as much in college and when I was younger until I moved out to Utah. Every, almost everything I did up at Tech, the outdoorsy things, uh, led me to choose Utah because I've I've never been to Utah, but I read so much and I've seen videos of um, everything that people have done out there between the national parks that are here, the um, the ski resorts that are here, and then some some of the off-roading that I've seen. Like in Moab, you got your famous off-road trails. Um, I didn't expect to ever be able to do them someday, but we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, yeah, it, it definitely solidified my choices. Like this state has everything that I want and more. And it's super appealing for me. And it still is to this day. I've been out here for just over three years now. And I, I don't look back on it at all. It's just amazing. I had an experience out there that I don't think I'd ever get to re redo anywhere. Cause I actually ran into this group of Polish climbers who were trying to do some of the state high points in, uh, in the United States. And one of their guys actually left their backpack like near the summit. And they were like, oh, no, like his passports in there, his uh, like his money, his ID, everything was in there. So he couldn't get home. So he he and another person in the group started to walk back towards the mountain. And I was doing it in a day. So I, I was lighting fast and they were like, hey, if you find it, could you bring it back down and like hand it off? I was like, yeah, yeah. So that was at like mile four or five. And then at mile around I think it's mile like 12 or 13 while well, I'm about 200 feet below the summit, I find the backpack and I'm like, whoa, like this is awesome, but I need to go summit first and then I'll bring this back. So that was my side quest. <laughs> um, so on the way down, I grab the backpack, I start running there back with it and I run into the two guys back coming back to the mountain and they were so thankful. So just happy that I was there to help them. And like, that's a memory that I'll always have. And if you don't try, you don't, you can't make memories like that. Um, so that, that's one I'm super proud of. And the video in the background right now is uh, just a venture day that Mount that it's called Mount Bora. It was Idaho State High Point. And Shane and I just had a great time, even though we kind of sandbagged ourselves and had to go down to this huge couloir. It's like, but we were fine. And we have all these fun adventures with friends. It's it's my whole channel is like not how hard I climb, not how far I run, not how much vert I get per day. It's all about the adventure. Um, so like that's kind of the progression of trying something, trying something and then just keep going and getting harder and harder or longer. And yeah, so that's like the progression I've been seeing in like peak bagging type uh, events. So. And that's one of the reasons I started this channel so I can learn about all these new different things that exist in the world and kind of expand my mind uh mm -hmm. talk to people that are doing cool stuff and then kind of motivate myself to do it as well i think that's like with any sport whether it be cycling or skiing or whatever right you show up as a neophyte with whatever gear you can afford at the time and you're comparing yourself to these people that have been doing it for five or ten years right so they've got all the the cool bits and bobs and they've got some of that experience but i think like true to form i mean you'll meet people that have their own little nose up in the air but the majority of in the cycling aspect is everyone's been there 
And there's still a lot of people that carry that mantra about it doesn't matter what you have, right? So there still is high-end racers who show up with pretty battered, you know, put together, hobbled together gear and are racing on an old bike and they still get out there and give her. And that's just, mm -hmm. I think, really shows that, that um, you know, off-road touring and bike packing is very accessible. A lot of people that I talk to that, that are wanting to get into it are all about like, oh, well, I need this bag and I need that bag. And I, it's like, no, you don't. You need to throw your tent on the front of your handlebars with a bungee cord and you need to take a backpack and throw your sleeping bag in the bottom of it because it's going to be the biggest thing. Throw a little bit of food in the top and ride to your closest campground out of town and make an overnight of it and pick some different trails or places that you haven't ridden to get there. And that's it. That's essentially how you can start. And you don't need lots of fancy stuff. You know, if you've got a tent or something that's a shelter, depending on where you live, for some people it's warm enough that it's just a tarp over top in case it rains and they sleep on the ground and that's it. Um, so it's really, it's very accessible. As long as your bike is in reasonably good condition and you can get there and back and ride within your, you know, your comfort zone for distance, that's how easy it is to enter bike packing if you want to look at it that way. Yes, it's nice to have good gear and light gear and small gear, but there's a time for that. You don't need to have everything super light, super small and compact. And even my own gear, I'm starting to expand on that. I'm starting to enjoy bringing a frying pan with me again, rather than a one hot cook, right? So, I mean, it's uh, it's all tailorable and scalable. And that's the thing. That's what I like about it. It's, it's purely scalable from being, you know, your beginning ride to big, huge, you know, monthly or yearly expeditions where it takes you a year and a half to go ride something, right? I don't know. It seems like everything that you're doing is kind of paving paving the way for how to think about this stuff to make it safer um, and more comfortable for people to ride on, which, you know, maybe that that presents the opportunity for more people to get in, involved into this and, and like actually take on snow skating and see it more out in the wild. Like, how do you feel? Yeah. Does that seem accurate? Yeah, I th that's exactly how I feel about it. I feel like all of this stuff, taking, getting away from custom skis and custom mini snowboards and just riding squalls on snow skates is a huge step forward. Um, riding it in a longboard style where you have the ability to grab rail and put a glove on the ground allows you to stop safely in a way that other snow skaters just can't people tell me like oh i can you know like people are actually baffled by my glove down slides and turns it doesn't make sense snow skaters tell me that they can't reach the ground on heel sides like as soon as you lean over far enough that you would be in a body position where you could touch your hand on the ground, you're already sliding and then you're just standing up sliding. Hmm. So I think we've really like pushed it to a new place where you can actually start to play around with these things. And is that, is that kind of where you see this going or is there, is there more to it? Do you see this kind of changing the snow skate racing scene, the, you know, the type of, you know, seeing more snow skates out in the wild, uh, like, like what else do you see for this, this progression? So, yeah, I mean, my official take on this is that snow skating still is, and maybe always will be just too difficult, right? Like you have to have experience as a longboarder and a snowboarder to really have a good shot at being a good snow skater. I've had friends who went from skateboarding directly into snow skating with no snowboard experience and vice versa, you know, from snowboarding directly into snow skating with no longboarding experience. And it just doesn't, number one, it's hard to learn that way. And number two, it just doesn't have that appeal for you. If you're not already a longboarder snowboarder, it's a fusion sport. So I think it's not very appealing. 
Um, but yeah, my official take is that I don't care. I don't want more people to start snow skating. If more people start snow skating and get hurt or let their skates fly down the mountain off leash, that's just bad news. So <laughs> my real goal in all of this is to set a new world speed record and put snow skating in a new category for snow sports. Right now, snow skating is kind of seen as like, like how you were describing it. It's scary. It's not approachable. You see other snow skaters and you see that they're kind of struggling to get down the hill and it doesn't really work that good. I'm trying to show people that you can actually make turns and control yourself and have a good time on these things. And one of the ways that I want to show that and one of the things I want to do with that is set a new world speed record. Snow skating remains the only snow sport with a speed record of less than 100 miles an hour. Can you guess the top speed for blind skiing? Oh my gosh. Uh, 115. It's exactly 100. So that's okay. the lower limit. One-legged skiing? 130 <laughs> 100. miles an hour. My gosh. So if you can fly down the hill on one leg on one ski at 130 miles an hour, there's simply no reason we can't do 100 on a snow skate. So this is like really what got me into snow skating in the very beginning was I looked at the Guinness World Records archives and I realized the world record speed for snow skating is 42 miles an hour. <laughs> Everyone does that. Like, I do that every time I snow skate. So why is it that uh, to this point, people have been either too afraid or there's just been no interest? I don't know. I just happen to come at like the crux of like where I live, Breckenridge specifically has a rich speed skiing history. We are home to the first speed skier to go 130 miles an hour, CJ Mueller. He kind of blew up speed skiing as a sport in the 90s. It was really just like a Colorado and Europe thing. And then when they did their Olympic demonstration event in 1992, and he set the new record of 130, that really changed speed skiing. So I'm, I'm coming into it with the legacy of speed skiing the legacy of squall carving, the legacy and history of longboarding on big mountain passes in the area. So I'm just like scratching my head. Like how has no one put this all together? This is so much fun. And every time I ride it, I'm like, I know I'm having so much more fun than everyone else on the slopes. 550. I mean, that was a pretty bad one. So I think it was on about Day three, I think, maybe. You do this horrific traverse across this mountain. It's called the Postman's Path. You're basically pushing your bike for about four or six hours. And you get to the end, and there's a tiny little village. And me and my mate, we knew that the cafe opened at 8 a.m. It was about 4 a.m. at this point. So we just laid our camp mats down on this little village green. And you're unconscious at this point. You're three or four days in. You've not been sleeping much, you know, maybe four hours a night at most. So you're fast asleep, your alarm goes off in the morning and you kind of wake up and I start packing all my kit away. And as I'm packing my kit up, I'm like, what is what is that smell? And I'm looking around everywhere. And then eventually I lifted my mat up and I put it down on the biggest dog poo <laughs> you've ever seen in your life. So then you've got this camp mat that you then need for another three days, absolutely smothered in dog muck. And what do you do with that? <laughs> So I try to rinse it off in the river and clean it as best I can. But at the end of the day, you've still got to wrap it up and put it inside your bag and drag it out <laughs> the next day. And the worst thing is you've got to blow the bugger up. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Just anything like that, you know. There's, uh, there's, yeah, endless, endless tales of all kinds of stuff. So, <laughs> but, That's uh, so funny. <laughs> maybe it was horrible. You had no sleep. <laughs> and then you're just, you're just cussing yourself out for the next few hours. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I did get home and put that mat in the bin. I couldn't even bear to clean it. <laughs> yeah. But I should have written down some of these stories, but uh, yeah. 
there's all there's all kinds yeah never ending in fact one of the most amazing tales actually we were in vietnam and uh you know the two t tunnels where they all all the vietnamese used to hide they built all these incredible tunnels tiny okay. little things and um if you put on a little bit too much weight, you'd never fit in them. They're amazing. Like to climb in them, you've got your hands above your head like this to get in. Tiny little tunnels, and uh, they have little guides who take you around. So somebody guided us around them all. And uh, the maps that we had were from. This is twenty years ago when I went there. These maps were from the sixties, the old military maps, and they were absolutely pointless. There were loads of new infrastructure that isn't on these maps. So we set off from this place, and we'd been riding. We'd done about. I don't know, 40, 50 miles. And we're going down this massive road. I can imagine it's like a freeway in America. This brand new, pristine tarmac road. And we're riding down it. And we knew where the sun was. This is back in the day before GPS systems. And we knew we were going in the wrong direction. But we didn't know where we were going. It was just We were just in this incredibly green spot. And um, we're just riding along thinking, wow, well, we'll just, we'll just see where we end up. Then this dude turns up on a motorbike. Open face helmet. He's like, oh, yeah, you're all right. We're like, yeah, thanks. He's like, I was your guide. I was your guide in the tunnels. I'm like, oh, my God. It is. It is as well. He says, do you know where you're going? We went, no, we're lost. So we stopped and we looked at this map. And he's like, yeah, yeah, this road isn't on the map. Come with me. So we get behind this motorbike and we're drafting this motorbike as best we can. <laughs> road about 20 miles. Got to this town and uh, walks in and he goes, Mum, I've got these two guests who are staying with us tonight. And we ended up just staying in this guy's house and sleeping on his floor, who we just happened to meet, <laughs> who was our guide, uh, just a few hours before. So they gave us this incredible Vietnamese meal. We stayed overnight. We woke up in the morning. We had an incredible breakfast with them. And then uh, we still didn't know where we were. <laughs> and he got this map out, and he kind of drew this little route on this map. And we got on in the morning and rode down this road. And eventually, yeah, we got to where we knew where we were, onto a road that was on this old map. <laughs> But tales like that, it's just amazing. You're not going to get that going from town to town in a car, are you? You know. So, no, it yeah, is. It's great. It's wild how, much, how often people like open up to you when you're you're traveling or you are, like I said, wearing that hobby on your on your back. Like I don't know. Yeah. You did a tour with a guy and he let you stay at a spot. Like that seems so uncommon, unsafe, and whatever. And you guys probably felt totally comfortable with all of it. I guess, how do you rank in, in each of your fields? I know you're kind of a freestyle guy, so I don't know how you do with downhill or border cross. Yeah, I'm trying to get better at those two, but um, I did. It was tough. It was a tough competition, actually. So it was one of these ones, um, and other people who do competitions might like relate. So everything was perfect in practice. Uh, for the freestyle and then I was so off like in the actual competition um, all the pressure and the nerves just made my body like my muscles react differently um, so but I still did okay I put down a couple of good runs but I did get kind of concussed like mid competition and uh, I went into the medical tent they were checking me over and I was like, oh, I just want to go out and land another run. So I've got a score on the board because you have to do you have to do two like good runs. And I'd only done one because um, I bailed the other one. Uh, and while I was in the medical tent, my friend Eamon, who was also competing, tried his first ever double backflip, which is crazy because it wasn't a very good. Oh it wasn't a very big jump. Um, he was the only person trying that. Uh, so I was hearing all this cheering. I didn't know what was going on. But then as I went out, I ran out of the medical tent to do my last run. They let me go and have another run. Um, he was hobbling in because he like <laughs> just about landed the back foot with his knees bent. So he, like, he sprained his ankle really bad. Um, so, yeah, he was going into the medical tent. and So we both had a bit of a shocker, but we, we tried our best. And I think I came maybe fourth in the freestyle and then uh a little bit lower than that in the board across got knocked out in my semi-final race um as in knocked out of the race not knocked out right. again <laughs> um and then the downhill is definitely not my forte so i actually 
borrowed my friend's board for that um, and crashed into a fence, but then made it down. So it was the craziest. It was like red um, ski pieces, which are okay on a snowboard when you can like get on your edge and actually slow down. But on a mountain board, you if you're trying to do that and slow down, you catch on the grass because you're not sliding like a snowboard. So you have a bit less control over your speed. Um, and it was super bumpy and like lots of kind of hidden dips and rocks and stuff. So that was terrifying. So I just did one. These boards have brakes on them, right? They're, they're just like hand brakes, especially for the downhill stuff. Uh, for the downhill, that's why I use my friend's board because it had a right. brake. So my, mine doesn't have a brake. You usually wouldn't ride with a brake, but for something like that, it was pretty useful. So, yeah, I didn't do amazingly in that. Um, but with all my results combined, I came fifth, which actually technically means first in the open. So I wasn't quite pro. I wasn't the top four, um, but I was, yeah, I was first in the open category. So Third special test of the first day. I hit a rock in the dust and got a super bad concussion. Um, but the first thing I said to myself when I opened my eyes was like, don't quit. Whatever you do, you <laughs> cannot quit. Uh, so I get up, like finish that special test. And then right after that special test was one of our time checks where we got to like, you know, get back on time and do any, uh, or eat any snacks, whatever, kind of fuel up. And they're asking me if I was okay. And I just wasn't answering, you know, I, I didn't want to tell anybody how I was really feeling. Um, I was kind of like that my whole life growing up. Like if I got hurt, I didn't want to tell anybody cause I didn't want to stop doing whatever I was doing. Uh, so I, I get up, somebody's like, Oh, your handlebars are a little crooked. I'm trying to kick my front wheel and hit my handlebars straight again. And you know, I'm missing my wheel. Like I'm like falling over. Um, now that I think about it, like I, I definitely should have stopped. But uh, I, I saw my parents and my my dad comes up to me and he's like, like he, he sees that I'm pretty messed up. And I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Like I'm, I'm not quitting. My mom comes up and she like grabs me by the head and she's like, look in my eyes. And all I could th like remember is thinking to myself, like I don't know where her eyes are. Like I could <laughs> not find her eyes. And um, so they, like they, they tell everyone for the U.S. support team, like around the track, that I was, I wasn't quitting. I was, I was going to keep going. Um, so I, I get back on the bike, keep going. I'm like riding up to arrows to see which way they're pointing because they're moving in my head. Oh, um, no. Finally, this, this is really stupid, but I finally make it <laughs> to another track where I'm getting gas, and I was like, I, I need to throw up. So I go behind the van, like hid that I threw up from everybody but one guy because I knew him. Um, he was like friends with my cousin. So I knew he wasn't gonna, I knew he, was, he had my best interest in mind. So like I, I told him, but like the second I threw up, it was like a light switched in my head and like everything was fine again. Um, I could see fine, felt fine, everything. I was all squared away. So I go to the doctor, I was like, hey, you know, I hit my head, whatever. Can I have some ibuprofen? Gives me that, I keep going, finish that day. Bad headache, whatever. Um, Parents knew what was going going on, but didn't really like. I wasn't gonna go around telling everybody, so I was like, "All right, you know, day two, we'll we'll feel better." Um, going to day two, head's a little a little foggy, but I clear up, and then I go in, and the fifth test of the day, I go through a rut, and my foot catches, and turns my foot all the way around, like to the back of my leg. Oh, and no. it snaps back, you know, and I, I'm like, okay, that hurt. I think it just twists my ankle. Go a little bit further and I crash. When I go to put my foot down, it was like my whole leg slid on the top of my foot. And I was like, that's that's not good. So I, you know, hop on one foot, get back on my bike and finish, finish the test. Um, once again, don't tell anybody because I don't want them to make me quit. And I was like, oh, it's, it's you know what they say in Miracle, like, foot's a hell of a long way from the heart. You know, I'm not gonna die. So I keep going, um, and then the rain starts falling towards the end of that day, and you know, I was I was pretty upset. As a 16-year-old kid, I was like, man, I screwed everything up these past two days. 
now it's raining, um, get through the final test of the day, get to the finish, barely get my bike into impound or, um, and like have to use it as a crutch to push my bike in. So then when I was walking out, like I, I was just gritting my teeth and, you know, fighting back tears because I didn't want to limp because I was scared that if somebody saw it, they were going to, you know, make me get x-rayed or something, and, you know, take me out of the race. So I basically just hid from everyone the whole weekend or the whole week that my ankle was destroyed. Um, had the doctor tape it up, all that. Did did the uh, the cortisone rub and all that stuff. Was taking motion every day. Made it to the finish somehow. Not really sure how. Like I got done and I was I've never been so exhausted in my life. Just mentally exhausted from just gritting it out all week. But as a 16 year old, I was you know didn't really realize how cool it was until like now realize what you went through and you're like, wow, that was, that was incredible. Like I, I should not have been able to do that as a 16 year old. Like I shouldn't have done that from a, a smart standpoint, but it, it was really cool. And then the U S won their first, the, for the first time in however many years. So that was like a cherry on top to finish my first one ever bike didn't break body survived. Um, and then the U S won and it was, it was like all hell broke loose. Like everybody was happy crying. Um, it was just, it was a super cool experience and that kind of gets you addicted to it. No matter how bad it goes, like you want to go again. Thank you for listening to the type two fun podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a follow and feel free to reach out to say hello, give feedback or share your type two fun story.